Thank you so much, and I thank my dear sister friend for more years than I think either one of us would want to admit. Uh, but I thank Carter for not only that introduction, but for more than that, for uh, inviting me here and for the work she has done over the years, over a lifetime, that even makes it possible for me to stand here. I thank as well the NAACP, Sheila Mooney, for their work and for, again, uh, having me here and this occasion. And of course, the wonderful people of St. Philip's and Reverend Anne Franklin for, again, just the privilege of this evening and the work that they do that makes something like this even possible and the importance, recognizing the importance of these kind of conversations. So without further ado, as they say, let's jump right in. It is probably an understatement to say that we find ourselves a nation as divided as we have ever been. It is a divide that runs far beyond being a Republican or a Democrat or a conservative or a liberal. This is a divide that is embedded in the very core of this country. Indeed, a divide which the 2016 election and the ascendancy of this new man to the White House has brought into clear relief. It is the divide of the color line about which W.E.B. Du Bois described in his classic 1903 Souls of Black Folk, as he said, the problem of the 19th century. Little did he know then that it would remain a problem two centuries later. For it is a problem about which this nation refuses to earnestly discuss. It is the problem of race. It is the problem of white supremacy. Race, more particularly white supremacy, is practically a taboo issue in this country, despite the fact that it continues to haunt us. And in no small way, it haunts us because we refuse to talk about it. Instead of confronting the legacy of white racism in this country, we as a nation, we as a people, would rather maintain a comfortable, if you will, racial amnesia and ignore the unrelenting realities of white supremacy that indeed compromise the possibilities of this nation ever being a nation united by a commitment to making its rhetoric of being a nation of liberty and justice for all a reality. There is no way around it. If we are ever to live into the democratic rhetoric of this nation, then we must have the uncomfortable conversations about race. And the stakes are even higher for those of us who sit in this room and claim to be church. To dare to make such a claim means that we have made a commitment to reflect the movement that is God in our world. And thus, we have made a commitment to be a glimpse of that which for Christians Jesus was so perfectly, that which is the movement of God's toward God's vision for God's people, a vision where all of God's children, and that means everybody who has breath, are able to live freely into whomever it is God has created them uniquely to be. And so it is a vision for a world defined not by that which divides us, but defined by that which unites us, our common sacred humanity, and hence our commitment to a world defined by the peace of God, which is justice. It is this vision to which we who claim to be church are called to reflect in the world. But we can't do that if we remain silent about that which divides us one from another and thus separates us from God's very vision for us, and that is racism, white supremacy. And make no mistake about it, for us to remain silent about this issue, these issues of race and racism is for us to betray what it means to be church 
and what it means to be children of God. Which brings me to this moment. In this brief time, I want to engage in a conversation about the dividing line of race through the way that I most experience it in this country as a mother before looking at what it means for us to be those people of God that we claim to be. So let me begin. You ready for a tough conversation? My son was about two years old. I had taken him to the park to play in a Flintstone-like car that was in the park's playground. This particular park was next to an elementary school. After being in the park for about 15 minutes, what appeared to be a class of first graders recessed into it. Two little boys, one blonde-haired, the other red-headed, ran down to the car where my son was playing. Seeing them coming, my son immediately jumped out. Soon, the two little boys began fighting over who was going to play in the car. My son looked on with the fascination of a two-year-old. The little red-headed boy, who seemed to be winning the battle for the car, saw my son looking. He suddenly stopped fighting for the car and turned toward my son. With all the venom that a seven- or eight-year-old boy could muster, he pointed his finger at my son and said, you better stop looking at us before I put you in jail where you belong. This little white boy was angry. A black boy had intruded upon his space. My son was guilty of being black in the park and looking. I was horrified. Before I could say anything to the offending boy, the white teacher who was in earshot approached. She clearly heard what the little boy said to my son. I expected her to have a conversation with the little boy and to make him apologize. Instead, she looked at my two-year-old son as if he were the perpetrator of some crime and said to the little boys, come on with me before there's trouble. At that moment, I was seething with anger. I took my son and I left the park. As we walked away, I felt an unspeakable sadness and pain. At two years old, my son was already viewed as a criminal. At seven or eight years old, the link between a black boy's body and a criminal had already been forged in the mind of a little white boy. If at two years old, a white teacher already regarded my son as a troublemaker, I feared what the future might bring. For I knew what every black parent knows, and that is this. The American society that our sons and daughters grow up in is raced to exclude them. When America's pilgrim and Puritan forebears fled England in search of freedom, they believed themselves descendants of an ancient Anglo-Saxon people who possessed high moral values and an instinctive love for freedom. These early Americans crossed the Atlantic with a vision to build a nation that was politically, culturally, if not demographically, true to their exceptional Anglo-Saxon heritage. Moreover, this was for them a divine vision as they traced their Anglo-Saxon heritage through the ancient woods of Germany to the Bible. Consequently, they considered themselves not just an Anglo-Saxon people, but also the new Israelites carrying forth a divine mission. Central to their vision, therefore, was not simply to build an Anglo-Saxon nation, but to build a religious nation, one that reflected the morals and virtues of God, which of course were synonymous with the virtues and morals of their freedom-loving Anglo-Saxon ancestors the implication being that God was essentially Anglo-Saxon. This Anglo-Saxon vision was soon to be shared by this nation's founding fathers, such as Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Essentially, through political architects such as Jefferson and Franklin, as well as the Pilgrim and Puritan founders, America's democracy was conceived as an Anglo-centric divine calling. These founders gave sacred legitimation to their Anglo-Saxon mission at the same time that they gave sacred validity to the Anglo-Saxon myth that undergirded it. As such, America was envisioned as a testament to the sacredness of Anglo-Saxon character and values, if not people. In order 
to safeguard this mythic vision, a pervasive culture of whiteness was born. Why? Because simply put, not everybody that looks like an Anglo-Saxon in the United States is actually Anglo-Saxon. The perpetual vexing problem for the nation is that from its very beginnings, it has been an immigrant nation with migrants even from Europe who were not Anglo-Saxon. Yet, there was a mitigating factor, at least for those who came from Europe. They were white. And this whiteness made all the difference. Not only did whiteness allow a person to pass as an Anglo-Saxon, but it also signified that an individual was capable of assimilating to Anglo-Saxon ways and values. Within this culture, to be white was to be considered Anglo-Saxon enough. Hence, to be white was to be privileged to, in to enter certain spaces and to claim certain rights. Put simply, Whiteness became essentially the passport into the exceptional space that was America, American identity, as defined by the Anglo-Saxon myth. From its earliest beginnings, therefore, America's social, political, and cultural identity was inextricably linked to the myth of Anglo-Saxon superiority. The city on the hill that the early Americans were building was intended to be nothing less than a testament to Anglo-Saxon chauvinism. Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Toni Morrison says it best. Deep within the word American, she says, is its association with race. Most significantly, she continues, those raced white. It was this association that had interrupted my son's day in the park. In their minds, he did not belong in the park. He had intruded upon their American space, that is, their white space. But there was also more, more about the privilege of being white that my son did not share with those who refused his uh, entrance into the car that day. Conversation two, stay above the fray. You can't do what your peers do. What they can get away with, you can't. These were words that I spoke to my son not long after he entered his majority white elementary school. My parents spoke similar words to my siblings and me when we were growing up. They spoke these words not to jaundice us against the world, but rather to let us know that the world was not going to treat us fairly. They were words to prepare us for the reality of what not being white meant in America. Their words introduced me to the realities of white privilege, words I found myself repeating to my elementary school age son some 40 years later. For even though certain legal protocols of race may have changed since my parents shared these words with me, the reality of white privilege has not. White privilege, it is the unspoken and taken for granted benefits bestowed upon white people by America's myth of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, which fosters and sustains notions of white superiority and black inferiority. W.E.B. Du Bois refers to these, as, these privileges as wages of whiteness. These wages, he says, are not about income. In fact, they even supersede the instances when the white worker might not be compensated more than the black worker. The wages or privileges of whiteness are far more valuable than economic comp compensation, for they concretize the distinction between white people and black people. They are a, as Du Bois said, sort of public and psychological wage. They go far beyond what it means to be a citizen. Simply put, they are added bonuses for not only being Anglo-Saxon enough, as mentioned earlier, but for protecting the Anglo-Saxon space. They are the privileges that make whiteness an impregnable wall between America's myth of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and those persons on the other side of whiteness. They are the privileges, if you will, to claim space and to exclude. And they are the privileges of assumed moral virtue and presumed innocence. 
the fact of white privilege hit home for my son early in his school years. It happened when he was punished for a classroom incident that he clearly did not commit. A white boy whose word was believed over my son's committed it. On that day, I watched a bit of my son's innocence taken away. He was upset that no one believed him and that his white classmates did not stand up for him. He learned on that day that whiteness carried with it a presumed innocence, while blackness carried with it a presumption of guilt. What he had yet to learn was that as he got older, a perception of danger would be added to the presumption of guilt. And while being presumed guilty in elementary school cost him recess or a day in the park, being perceived as dangerous could cost him his life. Conversation three, if the police stop you, keep your hands in plain sight. Tell them where you are going. If they ask for your ID, hand it to them and let them know that you are reaching for it. Don't talk back, do what they tell you. Even if they tell you to get on your knees, you do so. For that moment of humiliation may save your life. I am your mother and I will defend you to my death, but I do not want to have to defend you in your death. From the time he entered adolescence, I spoke these words to my son. I repeated some version of them every time he left the house without me, and I continue those instructions today. This is a conversation that no black mother or parent wants to have with her children, but one she knows she must have with them, especially with her sons, if she is to help them safely navigate a world that again views them as always guilty of something. It is a conversation about strategies for getting around, as novelist Toni Morrison described similar conversations she had with her sons, as she instructed them to, as she said, always say, sir, if an officer stops you. How has it happened that our black bodies have become trapped in this web of guilt? In America, the principal construction of the black body is as chattel. The black body was introduced into this country as property and thus as a body not meant to be free. Again, the free space was deemed a white space and thus a space not intended for non-black, non-white people, especially black people. This race demar demarcation of space was clear as long as black people were legally chattel. However, after emancipation, it became more difficult to maintain. Black people began to enjoy some of the freedoms that white people had, such as the right to vote, and most notably, the right to free space. Moreover, with emancipation, white people became consumed with the fear that black people, in fact, no longer saw themselves as chattel, if ever they did. There was a new urgency, therefore, to return black people to their place as chattel, that is, to an unfree space. This was accomplished by transforming the chattel body into a criminal body. This transformation began following the brief period of reconstruction in this country as legal and extra legal measures such as black codes and Jim Crow laws were enacted which effectively criminalized the black body and thus assured its removal from the free white space. The very conditions of black living following emancipation, such as not having a stable job or reliable housing or being a vagrant, those conditions were made illegal. To be black was therefore to be marked as a criminal. And this was made real as black people were jailed or regulated to force labor literally for living while black. It is in this way that the construct of chattel was seamlessly transformed into a criminal construct. As such, it removed the black body once again from the free white space. This construct of the criminal black body has been sustained in the 21st century the same way it was sustained during post-emancipation America. 
through racially biased laws, such as the drug laws, stop and frisk, and stand your ground. Michelle Alexander, who's the author of The New Jim Crow that some of you perhaps are familiar with, has called the prison industrial complex the New Jim Crow. She is right in the sense that it does, as she says, function as a well-designed system of racialized social control in a manner, she says, strikingly similar to Jim Crow. The laws that have been generated to ensure a majority black in prison population certainly are updated versions of Jim Crow laws. Nevertheless, the prison industrial complex is about more than the Jim Crow laws that make it work. This complex the attempts to reinstall in a more acceptable 21st century manner the same system that Jim Crow was developed to reinstate, slavery. The prison industrial complex returns the black body back to its proper place. It virtually re-enslaves the black body by putting it behind bars. If the black criminal is the new chattel, the industrial prison complex is the new slaveocracy. With jails and prisons serving as the new plantations, white space is again protected as black bodies, male and female, are grossly and disproportionately incarcerated. Indeed, to see the black body is to see a criminal body. Therefore, the officer who shot and killed Michael Brown thought it reasonable to describe Brown as a demon just as it seemed reasonable that the officer who killed 12-year-old Tamara Rice might mistake him for a 21-year-old threatening man. The black female body has been criminalized as well, as it is often portrayed as criminally immoral and most times just simply mean and angry. Hence, a 15-year-old Jasmine Darwin is slammed to the ground by a school police school resource officer, as was the case little more than a year ago here in the state of North Carolina. Or a Sandra Bland ends up dead after she is viewed as a threat in jail. The point of the matter is it is virtually impossible for a free black person to enjoy the presumption of innocence. Again, as much as black people are free, they have transgressed white space. And so free black people are inherently guilty. Worse yet, if a black person enters a, white, a space where a white person is standing their ground, then that black person poses a clear and present danger. Next conversation. Just saw the video of police call, killing yet another black man. As always, be careful, stay safe, and remember what to do if you were stopped for whatever reason by the police. Hands on steering wheel, do nothing, say nothing, stay alive. This is the text that I sent my son after watching the video of Philandro Castile being killed by police officers for no readily apparent reason. My son responded to the text this way. Oh yeah, it didn't help Philandro, so now what am I supposed to do? With my son's question, I felt that powerlessness, which James Baldwin aptly describes every time black parents, that every black, that every black parent feels at some point in time. It is a feeling that, as he says, no matter what you do, you are powerless. You are really powerless against the force of the world that is out to tell your child that he has no right to be alive. In no amount of liberal jargon, Baldwin says, and no amount of talk about how well and how far we have progressed, does anything to soften or to point out any solution to this dilemma. So I called my son when I received his text so that I could really hear what his words were trying to impart. What I heard was not fear or even resignation. I heard simply simply a sobering awareness of what it meant to be black in America. At some point in the life of every black woman and man, they must face, Baldwin says, the shock that the flag to which they have pledged allegiance along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to them. 
It comes as a great shock, he continues, to discover that the country which is your birthplace, again, to which you owe your life and identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. This was the shock that my son was coming to grips with on the morning after Philandro's slaying. It is the shock of the color line of race in this country, the shock of that reality of white privilege, the shock of that reality of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, and the culture of whiteness that continues to divide, to divide us in this country in ways as profound, if not more profound, as ever. For the matter is, we find ourselves in this current moment of deep racial division. Why? Because of a campaign and presidency that has by and large unearthed and revitalized, even as it is so freely and guilefully played into the Anglo-Saxon narrative and culture of whiteness that is the odious underside of America's identity. And now let me, I've got, I can't, can't, not say a word about this vision to make America great again. And so I must, even perhaps to the discomfort of some, that the vision to make America great again is indeed a 21st century effort to carry forth the legacy of the Anglo-Saxon myth, again, the culture of whiteness that protects it, was made abundantly clear during the presidential campaign. Recovery of America's greatness was shrewdly associated with the country ridding itself of non-white immigrants whose very presence, according to Donald Trump, has sent the nation spiraling into social disarray and moral decadence. To bolster this prescription for America's greatness, Trump trafficked in disparaging misrepresentations of Mexican Americans as rapists, again of African American communities as dangerous enclaves of criminality. And he continues to do so today. His vision for greatness therefore resonates with those who have longed for an Anglo-Saxon white America. And so it is no surprise that this administration's solution to the uh, to America's carnage, as Trump describes it, is one that ignores the violence that is white supremacy, the violence that destroys black and brown lives, and instead seeks to protect the greatness of America that is white. Thus, his administration puts forth a law and order agenda that doubles down on the kind of sentencing that will again enhance the prison industrial complex. We need law and order, he says. If we don't have it, we're not going to have a country. If there is any doubt of what he means, all one has to do is look at the White House website, again, the mandate by Attorney General Jeff Sessions to seek the highest penalty for crimes committed, basically re-energizing the mandatory sentencing that proved to be racist. As for the reality of poverty to which people of color are again disproportionately trapped, as Trump's secretary of HUD, Dr. Ben Carson said, that is in one's mind. Thus demonizing the victims as opposed to recognizing the violence of poverty itself. Likewise, Trump's restrictive immigration policies and attacks upon DACA reflect again the violent culture of whiteness. In the end, the mantra of greatness has been a clarion call to action for those who have clung tightly to the Anglo-Saxon white vision for this country. No one made this clear than past imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke, when he said, we are determined to take our country back. We are going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for him, because he said he is going to take our country back. That's what we got to do. And here is the most disconcerting fact, I think, of all. Not only did 81% of white evangelicals support this violent white vision of greatness, but so too did 58% of non-evangelical white Protestants and 60% of 
uh, white Roman Catholics. In general, white Christian America found common cause with a racist vision of America's greatness. And so, what does this mean for us as people of faith as we sit here on this evening? As sobering a moment as it was for me to hear a young white child threaten to throw my son in jail and thus realize in that moment the conversations I was bound to have with my son over his lifetime to keep him safe and sound as he navigated his way through the color line, I was left wondering what conversations the mother of the angry little white boy was having or not having with her son that allowed him to look at my son and see a criminal. The point of the matter is this. Conversations about race are not black conversations. For the color line is not simply a black problem. As I've attempted to point out, I hope, white people are raced as well. They are raced white. This is what right privilege is all about. And this brings us to a point of decision about what kind of people we want to be and thus who we are as people of faith, who we are as church. Do we want to be a people raced by a line that divides us one from another and thus betrays our common humanity and thus who we are as children of God or not? Do, are we those who, call, are those who call ourselves church or people of faith, regardless of what community of faith that might be? Are we those, are we committed to a world, I'm sorry, that carries forth the vision of our pilgrim and Puritan Anglo-Saxon forebears? Or are we committed to a world that carries forth the vision of God, a vision of a world of justice for us all? If the latter is the case, then we must be committed to at least three tasks to which I will just name and speak briefly and then sit down. What are those three tasks? The first is the task of what I call moral memory. We as a people and as a nation will certainly continue to be held captive to the dividing line of race and white supremacy until we as a people in a nation confront it in the history it has created. And this is what moral memory is all about. Moral memory is a memory defined by telling the truth, even the harsh truths about who we are as a nation and as a people, and then taking responsibility for the truth it tells. We must be clear that the impact of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and white supremacy will not go away just because we refuse to acknowledge it. Moreover, it is not playing the race card to talk about racism in the way it is an integral part of the DNA of this country. William Faulkner said it right, the past is never dead, it is not even past. For as long as the truth of our past is not confronted, it will not be dead. Rather, it will continue to control our present realities and shape our future. It is only in employing a moral memory that we will ever be able to be honest about the very real racial racist contract upon which this country was built and continues to be enacted and that the and that the divides of race, until we have a moral memory, those divides of race will not be healed. And so, if we are to lead the way toward the vision that is God's for us, then we as a faith community must lead the way in engaging in a moral memory, which by the way means, by, means starting with ourselves. We have to tell the truth about who we have been as communities of faith, about our own ecclesiastical bodies. For instance, the Episcopal Church must tell the truth about what it has meant to be a white colonial church 
protecting notions of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and what the legacy has created in terms of our, church, our church's leading demographic, that is one that is between 87 and 90% white. In other words, what is needed in our churches and in our society is an airing of family secrets, a settling of old ghosts, lest those old ghosts of racism continue to haunt us. Yeah. This brings me to the second task required for us as a faith community. And this is indeed to engage in a moral identity. To claim a moral identity in this our society shaped by a kind of culture that privileges whiteness, even as it penalizes, sometimes unto death, those who are the non-white other. To claim a moral identity is to in fact name and denounce white privilege. Even as white privilege ascribes a false sense of superiority to white Americans at the apparel of the non-white other, especially to black people, it is not the non-white other, that is those without the benefits of white privilege that are the most dehumanized. Rather, it is the humanity of those who live out of and into the privileges of whiteness that is most compromised and degraded. For the fact of the matter is, the only way that they can be who they are is by claiming a privilege that belittles the humanity of others. Baldwin therefore rightly observes that white people's sense of self for far too long has depended upon the lie that black people are inferior to them. And tragically, what white people have not realized is that in this debasement and definition, he says, they have actually debased and defined themselves. It is in this way that to be white is an immoral choice. For it is the choice to see oneself as better than another and thus it is the choice to betray the truth of our very sacred common humanity, which is that everyone who has breath or has ever had breath is without question a sacred child of God's, reflecting God's own image, nothing more and nothing less. In the words of black theologian James Cone, just because one looks like a white American does not mean that one has to act like it. <laughs> and, and so it is. <laughs> and so it is that whiteness is a sinful choice. And likewise, the culture that privileges whiteness as they both separate us from God, again distorting the sacred dignity of all of God's children. And so, it seems that it is, we have the responsibility to begin to name and to let go of the very privileges of whiteness. Let me now move on to the final aspect of who we must be if indeed we are in fact committed to being church and thus being a people reflective of God's vision for freedom and justice for all. Not only must we maintain moral memory, moral identity, but we must claim moral participation. If faith, and it is, is about partnering with God to help mend the world, then we as people of faith are compelled to join God in mending the world of the injustice that is the division of race in this country. And this is what moral participation is all about. What, practically speaking, does this look like? It means at least two things, I think. That our churches and our places of worship should be places of sanctuary and witness, as should be we. To be a sanctuary means that no one, no one, should ever feel diminished or unsafe because of who they are or are not when they are in our presence and in our space. And so we must work to make our churches, our homes, our communities, spaces free of bigotry or intolerance of any kind, not simply in their most overt ways, but perhaps in the ways we don't even readily notice. 
ways it may be embedded, for instance, in the fabric of our buildings, or even in the fabric of our programming, in the fabric of our worship, the ways in which we relate one to another. And we can talk more about that in conversation. Secondly, we are each called to be a witness, a witness to the very vision that is God's for us. It is one thing to protest against injustice and racism. It is, in protest we must, but it is quite another thing to be proactive and work toward and reflect the vision of God for us, which means nothing less, of course, than calling out racism, xenophobia, and any other kind of ism of bigotry for what it is, even when it masks itself in the political correct language of greatness. But it also means, more importantly, being the change we want to see by being in our own lives, those sanctuaries of God's very future that means justice. This I know to be true, that without our commitment to moral memory, identity, and participation, we betray our very identity as people of faith, indeed as children of God. So let me end with this. Scholar, Black feminist Audre Lorde is right. Raising black children, she says, male and female, in the mouth of a racist, sexist, suicidal dragon is perilous and chancy. If they cannot resist in love at the same time, they probably will not survive. Through the conversations I have had with my son, I have tried to provide him with the fortitude to resist the degrading assaults of white America so that he can love himself regardless. I have done my best to ensure his survival. But at the end of the day, I cannot keep him home sheltered from a white world constructed to destroy him. So even as I pray at the beginning and end of each day that God be my eyes and be my hands and watch over my son, protecting him and bringing him safely home, what I truly pray is that the church and those people who claim to be people of faith will step up and be church, will act like people of faith, will act like children of God in this world at this time so that all of our children in this generation and in generations to come will be safe and free to live into whomever God has created them to be. Let us therefore resolve on this evening to be not consoled until all of our children can proclaim the reality that is God's justice. I'll end here, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm getting ready to take care of my grandson, who's two months old. He has a daddy who is African American. His mother is called Chinese. And that's also called quite American. I have, first of all, thank you so much for sharing with us your story. I want to be a positive influence in my grandson's life. What should I teach him? Every day I would be with him. Do I, how do I teach him that we're all the same? We need to love each other and that we need to also be firm and stand up for our rights in a matter that is loving and non provocative Or maybe there's no such thing as non provocative Do we need to be provocative? Yes. How do I do that? Well, that's a, thank you, thank you. And that's a big question. Let me um, say this one, you've just described, described your, grandson's parentage, so uh, I, I will assume he is of color. 
a uh, child of color and that he will be seen as that in the world. Uh, as he walks about, people will see a young man of color. And so, in, in this America. And so, one of the, f the very first conversation I ever had with my son and that I continued to have until I didn't, till he got too old and I didn't need to have it. First thing I did was say to him, Desmond, this is when he was born. And every morning I would say the same thing. I would say, Desmond, there is no one greater than you but God. And you are greater than no one every day. Desmond, there is no one greater than you because I wanted to instill in him because I knew that the world was going to be treating him in such a way that uh, he would be hard for him to understand his very greatness and that there would be nothing around him through his day-to-day -day walk in this world that would affirm his very personhood as a black child, and as, since it's a child of color. So I wanted to connect him to that in whose image he was created and let him know that that was who he was as a child of God, to safeguard him, almost as that buffer. My mother used to sing to us as kids every night, Jesus loves you, this I know, because the Bible tells you so. And I didn't understand why she would sing that to us until we were treated in unloving ways. And then we could sing to ourselves, oh, Jesus loves us, this I know. So the first thing is to instill in him a sense of whose he is and hence a sense of his very greatness. The second thing is to instill in him a sense of who he is, connect him to his deep roots. That is his own cultural, ethnic, racial roots and let him know that in spite of what white America may say about the people from whom he came, they were a great people. Uh, to, uh, and to know the richness of their story, the richness of their history, uh, to, uh, the richness of what they have created to reflect the very sacredness of God. I always tried to tell my son not only who he was, but who he was. Uh, to, uh, and then, in the story of those people that are people of color in this our world, because white supremacy is global, uh, and pervasive, those people of color, they've always fought and struggled for a justice that they believed in, and that is the justice that is God's. I, one of the things that I continue not to be able to wrap my head around, but that moves me forward, and this gets to the last part of your question, inspires me is the reality of the fact that there were people who were born into slavery, who died in slavery, never having breathed a free breath, and never believing that they would ever breathe a free breath. Yet they continued to fight for freedom, a freedom that would not be theirs, but a freedom that they knew would be because they believed in the freedom that was the justice of God. And they held themselves accountable, not to the way things were, but indeed to that future. And so I tried to raise my child and, and for, for your child, your grandson, to, to be accountable always to that, to those people who fought for the reality of his freedom and to be accountable to God's future. And so it's in this way that Toni Morrison says that even as we inhabit the present, we, should, we are shaped by the past and by the future. And so that may, may mean, yes, as I talked about, you can't be quiet when there is injustice all around. And I know what you mean about not being provocative. Injustice should make us be provocative. But, there, but, you know, but I say the people who need to be the most provocative are the people who have the least to lose in terms of their lives. 
And so it is to uh, those people who have been born into the privilege of whiteness, not only to denounce that privilege, but in denouncing that privilege to be as provocative as they can be to destroy and dismantle systems and structures and ideologies that make that privilege a reality in a clear and present danger to those who don't enjoy that privilege. To our children, I say, you know, first thing you need to do is live. And as you live, live not yearning to be white, but live yearning to be free. And so that's, that's my quick answer to your question. And God bless. Pray a lot. Yes, I... Yeah, you know, thank you, good, good question. The first, you know, look, there are certain folk, you know, perhaps like the David Dukes of the world, that they just aren't gonna get it. And those aren't people that you waste your conversation time with. What you do is make sure that you create a world that they're way uncomfortable in. And what you do, so that they become the exception, not the rule. And what you also do is get louder than them. Here's, here's the thing, and then I'll talk about these conversations, who are these conversation partners are to be. Here's the thing, people, Christians decry how uh, the certain segment of white Protestant evangelicals are tarnishing what it means to be Christian, right? And Christians decry, we don't, that's not us, we don't, we aren't, that's not what Christianity is all about, but who would know that? <laughs> Since uh, those other Christians are silent or something, uh, and so we need to make clear what it means to be Christian. Which means that we don't. We need to make sure that they aren't the loudest voices in the room, and that we need to then take back that narrative, right? And so that they feel uncomfortable, not us. I mean, it's just amazing to me every time I hear why Christians talk about, oh, I'm so embarrassed to be a Christian. God, uh, why? Oh, because of those evangelicals. You should be embarrassed to be a Christian because you aren't acting like a Christian and shutting them up. And so we have to create a world in which they become the weeds. Uh, uh, and so that means we have to have a different set of conversations. So certain people you just say, you know, right, you know, there's certain people you just can't have a constructive conversation with. Uh, uh, so, but there are others who uh, don't even recognize, because the ways in which indeed they are contributing and complicit in the world that makes a David Duke feel comfortable. And because, hope I'm not being naive in this, I think most folk are decent people. And I know all people are created to be good because everything God created was good. And so it's just a matter People live in, we, we have been, let me back up a little bit, we have, this country has developed its own collective consciousness of whiteness and of white supremacy. And that has become a part of, knowingly or unknowingly, of our own individual and collective consciousness, if that's a word, and psyches. We've got to make people aware of that. We've got to help them understand and name what the privileges of whiteness look like and how they are indeed, even unwittingly, have been indeed uh, nurturing and fostering and creating a world that sustains that. So we have to have those, I always say, to those who happen to look like white Americans who get it, have to help other white Americans get it. Uh, to, and I think that the place that that has to happen, uh, that there's no excuse for it not happening in, are in places like this, in our churches. 
Martin Luther King Jr. said over 50 years ago that the 11 o'clock hour, that's when church started at 11 everywhere, it was the most segregated hour in America. It remains so. And, and that's not an indictment on churches. It's an indictment on America because until people... People worship together who experience similar things. And so until black and white people and people of uh, white people and other people of color began to experience the same kind of realities of living, they will all, we will always have worship, uh, a segregated worship hour. And so in order to not have a segregated worship hour, we must have uh, non-segregated life realities. And that will change what happens in the church. The other thing we know is this, studies have just shown us this, get that, a recent Pew study, is get that 90% of, no, 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 75%, three quarters of white Americans do not have a person of color in their intimate social circle. Right? Do not have pew study. And so that means, of course, we have different experiences of reality and different perceptions of reality. Again, so within white churches, we need to start having those conversations about race, about white privilege, and we have to begin to introduce people to ways of understanding and seeing other bodies as sacred bodies. That's a short, long answer to a very good question. Yes. I want to begin by thanking you for being here and for um, speaking the truth. I don't consider it your truth. I consider it our truth. Yes, indeed. Um, living here in Asheville. God bless. We thank you. Uh, I want to speak to the, the uh, presumption or the assumption that this is such a progressive and forward-thinking community. Um, I have several New Thought Christian white friends who, when it comes time for us to really grapple in these kinds of conversations, they have a tendency to want to fast forward and say, but yes, but we're all one. And uh, sidestep the process of moving into the, what does it mean to have that oneness? They just want to declare that principle so that we can all get beyond our history or get beyond our pain. And so how do you, uh, how do you respond in those kind of moments? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, common moments. Let me, I'm going to get right to that. I'm going to give a couple of, or one sort of example of how that happens in a different way. It's People don't like to deal with the pati certain particularities because they feel that those particularities might indict them in their own particularity, uh, for one. The other thing that one does when confronted with the issue of race, which is this common reality in this country, is that say, no, no, we're, we're all one, we're all equal. So again, that they don't have to confront the reality itself of race. One of the ways in which that has happened on the national scene has been, of course, of Black Lives Matter. Now, the reality of Black Lives Matter was just simply, it didn't say that nobody else's life mattered. They were trying to get people to say that Black Lives Matter, right? Uh, to, that when you look at a black body, it matters. Right? Because it has not mattered. And loaded in that Black Lives Matter is the reality of being black in this country, which means you know your body doesn't matter. Frederick Douglass said uh, way back when, Frederick Douglass said that a, a black boy's life is worth less than a penny in this country. Those are his words. And of course, that continues to be so. But the history has been that black lives don't matter. Instead of confronting and recognizing that history and just trying to affirm, yes, black lives do matter, folks immediately said, all lives matter. Now what, that's, what that really was was whiteness standing its ground and began refusing to 
confront and deal with the reality of the fact that we, why is it that we have to say that black lives matter? Because they have not mattered. So the first thing the churches can do is say black lives matter. Uh, uh, so an example, of course, of what you're talking about. So how do I d deal with that? There was a black religious scholar named Charles Long Carter, you probably, a late black scholar, uh, uh, wrote uh, on many things on this issue of race. He was one of the first to introduce uh, this country to the emergence of uh, the uh, black uh, Muslim nation in America uh, with uh, Malcolm X, et cetera. So, Charles Long, I once had the, not Charles Long, I'm sorry, um, Charles, tell me who I'm talking about. Lawrence. Who? Lawrence. No, he was James Cone's uh, mentor. His name will, uh, oh my goodness, see, don't get old. <laughs> but they tell me, they tell me it beats the alternative, but who, know, who knows until you see the alternative, right? Uh, uh, it, his name will come to me. I just, it's not Charles Long. I, it's uh, Charles something, and it'll come to me. I just want to uh, give him credit for this analogy and this image. And he said this, there's a pit that divides us in this nation. It is the pit of race. Now, there are several ways in which we can navigate this pit. One thing we can do is walk around it. And we both end up on the other side. But he said, that's not true reconciliation. That's cheap grace. He said, the other thing we can do is jump over it. And we both end up on the other side. Again? said, that's not true reconciliation. Cheap grace, and these things don't hold, because the pit is still there. The other way we can navigate this pit is to climb down into it and stay down in all that dirt and mud and grime that is down there. Get dirty, deal with it, and then climb back up the other side. That's what reconciliation is all about. Engaging with the truth and then asking, can we meet again? That's the meaning of reconciliation. So, in as much as white America doesn't want to climb down into the pit, then we will never have reconciliation. And that's my answer to that. So I don't want to talk about reconciliation. I want to talk about the pit. I'm going to find his name. I'm going to Google it in a minute. <laughs> Thank God for Google. Yes. I don't really know how much this is a question, but as you're speaking, I'm jot, jotting down notes and I'm putting in brackets big sigh, sadness, anger. And this is what I, I keep, I mean, I just mm -hmm. alternating between that. And then I'm just feeling that over a lifetime of the sadness, the pain, the the anger and then these different stories that you'd be telling your son, you know, behind these doors and then he's got to go out in the world and do a different dance. And it feels so easy to just give up mm -hmm. and not deal with that pit. Because that pit's really ugly. <laughs> And it, it's, um, it is sad, and it, it Yeah, but, and I think... So, well, to, to, I guess that 
when you brought up the pit, and then you also also talk about us being children of God. I mean, I'm really what I'm asking or, or wanting you to talk to is how we keep ourselves reminded that we are children of God, spirit. Because it, it just feels like I just wanted to go dig my dig the pit and go hide in the pit and cover myself up and pull my kid in there and yeah. So no. <laughs> there are, yeah, but there are days, uh, to, right? So one has to tell the truth of everyday living, and sometimes there are days where you say, you know what, forget it. Uh, to, there was one such, by the way, his name's C. Eric Lincoln. Uh, to, <laughs> You know, right, Carter, you remember that name now. See, Eric Lincoln. Uh, I will admit that there was one such day uh, for me, which was the day after the election. And I was, you know, I was a professor uh, at Goucher College. And I said, well, we're going to take a little mental health day because I did not want to come out of my house and have to deal with especially sad white people <laughs> coming up to me saying, <laughs> right? Saying, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Really? Uh, so I said, no. Nope. And so that was, yep, one of those days. Uh, and also, I remember when I was doing this book, uh, my most recent book, Stand Your Ground, and I really started out doing this book. It wasn't a book that I ever, ever, ever intended to do and had professed that I was done with book writing. Uh, to, again, was called, really compelled into this book by what was going on in our country, especially what, with what had happened to Trayvon and then the exoneration of the one who murdered him. Uh, and then the successive murders of uh, young black uh, girls and boys. And so anyway, I was researching this book and I, got, I thought I knew where it was going to take me. I thought I was going to end up in slavery and talk about the realities and the legacy of slavery. And so I really just started tracing the story because I wanted to know what is going on. So I started tracing the story and I ended up back first century philosopher Tacitus and this whole notion of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and Anglo-Saxon myth, etc. Here's my point. When I got there, I remember it as if it was yesterday, I was in my bedroom reading this book in bed and I chased through and I said, OMG, and I'm saying that because I'm in this church. Uh, uh, but I was astounded. And in that very moment, I felt no hope. And I said, I hollered in to my spouse. I said, we must get Desmond out of here. We got to send him to South Africa. He's a godfather in South Africa. So we've got to send him to South Africa. Imagine that I felt that place safer than here. But then, Here's, you say, what keeps you going? Here's the other, the good news, I guess, that which keeps, keeps you going. As I wrote this book, and part one of this book is all about this reality and the reality of white supremacy, et cetera. So when I got to part one, through with part one, and I, this book also wrote itself in a way in which other books did not for me. And I continued to trace the story and it deepened. And so when I got to the end of part one, I again thought, whoa, there's no place to go. And I knew, I'm a theologian and all that, that the second, I had intended the second part to be this theological reflection. And I, that didn't feel authentic. And I said, I didn't want to be talking about God is good and all of that and this sort of empty, utopian-like, pietistic uh, optimism, 
pie in the sky reality. And so I really felt that I had written myself into a corner. And sort of like when you, which I've done, don't learn once, when you're washing a floor or whatever you call it, uh, and you don't, you start from the door and go in instead of in and go out. And there you find yourself in a washed right into a corner. I felt that way with this book. And so I said, I thought that that particular night that this is it, this is as far it served its purpose as my writing's gonna go on this topic because there's, there's no hope. And then that night, and this is true, these words came to me, the words of Trayvon Martin's father, Tracy Martin, where Tracy Martin says, my heart is broken but my faith is not shattered. And that said to me, that called me back to black faith and the faith of my grandmother and the faith of those enslaved. With the recognition that black faith as it was born in the cauldron of enslavement did not emerge when everything was going right for black folk. Black people were talking about the freedom and justice of God and testifying to that, when indeed they were nowhere near being free and where they could not see any way of God's justice. But they believed, truly believed, in the promises of God, again, the one one reason that they could believe in it and it's the center of black faith was because of Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus, that Jesus was crucified, one indicated his absolute solidarity with the crucified classes of people of his day. His absolute solidarity with those people whose not simply backs were up against the wall, but for those people whom had no wall for their backs to be against. Those people on the underside of crucifying realities. Jesus gave up the privileges of his social, cultural, ethnic, religious privileges, and even his privilege of divinity. It's called kenosis. It's called letting go of white privilege. He gave all of that up, emptied himself of that unto the cross, to show his solidarity with that group of people. That's why black folks were able to have faith because of that Jesus of the cross. Were you there when you cru they crucified my Lord? The other side of that, what black folks are really saying is Jesus is there, is here in these realities of which I am crucified. So to recognize then that the central symbol of our faith as Christians is a symbol of a crucified God, points to the very contradictions of faith that are the contradictions and paradoxes of black faith and of continuing to believe in the justice of God when you know no justice. And so what is it, and I mean this wholeheartedly, that keeps me going is because I know and I believe in that Jesus that died on the cross, because that helps me believe in the promises of God's justice. It's why Martin Luther King Jr. could say, I've been to the promised land. And he said what? He said, I may not get there with you, but this I can tell you, we are all gonna get to the promised land. And he said that because he was a child of the black church. And so that's what gives me hope to keep going. I'm gonna end there. Is that okay?